Hi everybody, welcome to Healthline. I am Gregory Zarian. So, uh, the weather's changing a bit. I hope that means that you are getting up and getting out and spending more time outside. Um, and what's great about the weather changing is we're kind of getting off some of the Zoom workouts and even though most people are still working on Zoom, uh, that does not mean you do not have the opportunity to get up, go outside and just be more active. Uh, as we talk about here a lot on Healthline, or I say, with every excuse is a solution. So our mission here is to always share with you healthy solutions and invite you to do really healthy things. And if you don't want to go alone, uh, grab your mom, dad, sibling, parent, partner, friend, and do it together. Uh, as the saying is, teamwork is dream work. And as we want you to be as healthy as possible, we want you to get your blood pumping and break into a sweat and just get active and, and be outside and, and get your sport on, what you're doing when you do that is you're keeping your heart healthy. Um, how healthy is your heart? Uh, do you eat to keep your heart healthy? Do you pay attention to your heart going faster, slower? Do you have a lot of questions about your heart? And since February is Heart Awareness Month, I thought I would bring you one of our favorite people, Dr. Harry Ballian from Adventist Health Glendale, and his specialty is interventional cardiology. Uh, doctor, it's all about getting our heartbeat on. See That's how I it. did that? Yeah, I like that. Yeah, thank you. It's great to see you. Same here. Thank you for having me. Uh, love when you're here. Love that, uh, as you know, when I say you're one of, our, one of my favorite people, uh, we have a long history here. And it's always been an affair of the heart. Thank you for having me. So with everything that we have gone through in the past couple of years, how are we collectively doing with our heart and our heart health? COVID has really put a big uh, strain on our health system uh, and not only the different specialties as far as the uh, uh, patients with uh, pulmonary disease, uh, patients have also come in uh, with heart attacks. Even young people with no uh, 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 inherent heart disease, uh, they, have, they have come in with COVID infection. Subsequently, they've had uh, you know, vascular inflammation, uh, pulmonary embolus, heart attacks, uh, uh, heart muscle inflammation. So it's really uh, put a big damper on our health system. And us cardiologists have to really be very cautious when we have these patients coming in with COVID infection, especially the Delta variant. Uh, where it uh, literally uh, uh, you know, invades the vascular system and, and makes people hypercoagulable, makes people uh, prone to uh, not only heart attacks, uh, blood clots in their legs, blood clots in their vascular system and pulmonary emboli. Thank you, doctor. So let me, let me ask you a quick question. It's kind of like, hey, riddle me this. Um, when you hear about plaque in men and women, do men, men and women share the same type of plaques when it is connected to their heart? What do you think? Uh, have a glass of water, do 20 jumping jacks, and we'll see you on the other side. Don't go away. Welcome back. I hope you had two glasses of water. I hope you did 40 jumping jacks and maybe grabbed an apple or a carrot stick and uh, hope you called your friends to have them join you and get your heart health information on. Joining us from Adventist Health Glendale is one of my favorites, Dr. Harry Ballian. His specialty is interventional cardiology. Uh, Dr. So, we went into the first break with me throwing out a riddle me this. Uh, and as I was doing research this morning, uh, plaque on the heart for men and women is very different. Who is it more intense for? Is it more intense for men or for more, more for women? So that's a very good question. Uh, and it's not that plaque necessarily has a different uh, a, a physiology in men and women. It's, it's the presentation, it's the progression. So in general, women are actually protected, uh, shielded from premature plaque rupture and heart attacks and in the premenopausal women. Estrogen is actually protective. So whenever we see men and women, the premenopausal women are uh, have less incidence of plaque rupture and heart attacks until they become basically uh, at, at menopause, uh, they pretty much catch up to men. And uh, postmenopausal women uh, essentially then be have the same incidence uh, of heart attacks. So when you look at, when you dissect an artery and you look at the plaque buildup, 
uh, it doesn't necessarily pick and choose a man and woman as far as plaque progression, but it's the, it's the overall anatomy, it's the overall uh, protective nature of estrogen that makes it less likely for uh, younger women, premenopausal women, to have premature coronary disease. Of course, there's always an exception to the sure. rule. Uh, and lifestyle makes a big difference as well. Obviously, smoking, uh, uh, you know, uh, patients uh, that are uh, having a lot of the uh, uh, polyunsaturated fats, etc. When you look at the third world countries where there's a lot higher incidence of smoking, you see women uh, are having a higher onset of uh, premature coronary disease uh, just as men are. Uh, so, uh, also, we do have uh, uh, women that have uh, any kind of a vasculitis, you know, vasculitis, uh, lupus, uh, uh, and, and the different uh, uh, vasculitis where they have an actual inflammation of the walls of their heart, of their arteries, and they can also be prone to having uh, uh, premature onset of heart attacks and closure to their arteries. Who's more susceptible to heart attack, men or women? Well, men are susceptible <coughs> to heart attack, uh, and um, it, 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 the, the premenopausal women are less likely, but then, as I said, at time of menopause, men and women essentially, uh, women catch up to men. Uh, they, and then also there, there's a whole slew of the presentation of women is completely different uh, as far as their heart attacks. Uh, they may just present with weakness, they may present with, with dyspepsia or nausea, not the classic uh, uh, you know, uh, Levine sign where, they, and, and where you're having this crushing left lower sternal border chest pain. Which is more directed, <coughs> more directed toward men. Correct. Women have more of vague symptoms, whether it's fatigue, whether it's nausea, whether it's heartburn. Uh, so it's less typical than, than uh, the men's presentation of heart attacks. So a lot of times women are underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed okay. where they come into the emergency room and they're diagnosed as having abdominal symptoms and GI related symptoms and then heart attack may be missed. Uh, so that's actually something that we have to pay, pay very close attention to not underdiagnose uh, uh, women as we have been traditionally. So I want to run through this really quickly. So um, signs and symptoms of a heart attack for a woman, they are nausea? They can be. Can nausea, be what? fatigue, uh, shortness of breath, a decreased exercise uh, uh, tolerance uh, where they were able to do a lot more like let's say a few days ago and now they're sort of like a couple of steps and they're worn out, you know, they're short of breath, et cetera. Is it one incident or it's chronic incidents of the same symptoms? It could be, it could be both. Okay. Um, so so, so uh, there, are, there are times where, uh, you know, women, especially, and then we're, this is more common actually in diabetic women where the, their chest pain or their anginal symptoms are very vague. Okay. Uh, so they can just simply have fatigue and weakness and that could be their sign of heart attack. They may never have chest pain. Uh, uh, and so, and that also may apply to men, but in general, women have very much atypical presentation of heart attack uh, signs and symptoms. And for men, signs and symptoms are? Well, I mean, the signs and symptoms for men for heart attack, the classic one are the Levine sign where you're having left lower sternal border ch uh, chest pain and you don't have the, uh, the four Ps. It's not palpable, pleuritic, positional, pointy. Those are uh, pretty much uh, point, uh, those can be very much tied into non-cardiac musculoskeletal pain. If, so, if, a, if the chest pain is palpable where you can actually push your chest wall in and then you can reproduce it. Uh, positional, when you lay to your left side, it hurts more. Uh, 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 pointy, there's like one pinpoint. <coughs> it feels like some a needle is poking on your heart. Uh, those are all consistent with a non-cardiac or musculoskeletal type pain. A lot of people have what's called costochondritis, where the ribs, where they join the middle portion of your rib, that you can have inflammation of the cartilage and that can actually hurt and feel like a heart attack. But again, a lot of this is very much inflammatory based and non-cardiac. Uh, it's not a plaque rupture inside your arteries. It's actually an inflammation of the cartilage uh, uh, in your ribs that, that, are, that are joined together. So bottom line too though, is if you or someone you love is suffering from any of this, yes. uh, don't become a doctor and go to WebMD, call your doctor. Absolutely, and when, somebody, when somebody's having some of these symptoms, I would, I would advise them to take a baby aspirin, which is a, it reduces mortality from heart attacks by 25%. So everyone uh, should take baby aspirin. If you feel that you're having okay. uh, what seems to be uh, uh, you know, like a heart attack type symptom, Got you should it. take an aspirin, get yourself to the emergency room as soon as possible.
and preferably if, if your symptoms are escalating, you, would, you should probably get there via ambulance rather than choose to drive yourself, drive yourself there because it will delay. As, as we know, time is muscle. The sooner we get to uh, the emergency room, the sooner we're able to get treated. Uh, as, you know, and that, that can be life-changing. Well, with stroke, time loss is brain loss, but yes. with heart, time loss is muscle, muscle loss. Muscle loss, yes. And, and the difference between the, the brain and the heart is the brain is very unforgiving. So within minutes, you're going to have irreversible brain damage. Uh, and with the heart, you have a little bit more time. You have probably within an hour or so, <coughs> after which you're going to have uh, irreversible heart muscle damage. Uh, and so, so again, uh, the sooner you get to the emergency room, the sooner your diagnosis is made, the sooner we can get you to the cath lab, open up your artery, and then basically uh, get things moving again. More with Dr. Ballion when we come back. Don't go away. Welcome back to How Fine. So if you haven't received your COVID-19 vaccination yet or your booster shot, please slow the spread of this horrible virus by getting vaccinated as soon as possible. Wear your mask when advised and also wash your hands, pay attention, socially distant. We are all in this together and it is basically us doing it for one another. So pay attention, be thoughtful, be mindful, and uh, we will get through this together. The entire conversation is all about you, me, and all of our hearts. We are here to get our heartbeat on, so joining us from Adventist Health Glendale is heart specialist, Dr. Harry Ballion. Uh, doctor, I wanna back up just a little bit really quick, because um, during the break we were talking about who has more intense plaque, men or women, and you were sharing with me that plaque for women is, uh, is different. Why, so when you look at the caliber of vessels in general, men, women uh, have smaller diameter arteries. Okay. Uh, so as far as plaque buildup and progression, let, uh, just going through the timeline, when you have a plaque inside your artery, that's almost like a pimple developing inside the inner layer of your vessels. And in time, that pimple develops an envelope, like a, like a little pr protective layer. As the envelope thins because of smoking, stress, etc., you develop cracks in, on the edges of, the, of that envelope, and then you, uh, you spew out the contents of the plaque in, into your vessel. As your bloodstream is flowing through your arteries and your blood cells, namely the platelets, see this content of the plaque, they, the, the clotting cascade is activated, and that's how people get heart attacks. That, that's how people get strokes. That's how people get peripheral vascular disease and acute closure of their arteries on, your, on their legs. So whenever you have a plaque rupture, uh, and that can happen to men, women, uh, and it just depends on their lifestyle, their genetics, etc., you have basically clot formation, and the blood thickens inside your artery, and eventually you have an abrupt halt of blood flow, and that's how you get heart attack. And, then, and so heart attacks themselves can be uh, what it's called non-ST elevation in my where you have actually a, a sort of a breakthrough, the blood slows down and then, and then speeds up again. And that, that, and you can still have a small heart attack in, in, in the process, or you can have what's called ST elevation in my where you have an abrupt closure of your artery and you have no flow. And then at that, be, at that point, it becomes an absolute emergency to get yourself to the hospital. And then we have to get you to the cath lab, put a catheter inside and then try to open up the blockage and then put a balloon and then uh, open up with a balloon and put a stent Otherwise, you have irreversible heart muscle damage. Same thing applies with the brain. Whenever you're having a stroke, you have to get yourself to the hospital, and then they either give you the clot buster medicine, or they can actually take you to the cath lab, and then they can go up, and then they can uh, suck out the clot uh, and uh, balloon the vessels as necessary. Uh, cardiovascular disease, what are, what are cardiovascular diseases? Heart attack? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a whole slew of, so cardiovascular disease, can entail, uh, you know, uh, heart uh, heart attack, uh, you know, plaque progression, heart attack, heart uh, uh, muscle dysfunction, uh, heart failure, uh, whether it's heart failure due to heart muscle weakening or heart muscle not relaxing properly. So that's called systolic heart failure or diastolic heart failure. Uh, cardiovascular disease can entail valve valvular disease, where you have actually wear and tear of the valves, which are the sort of the gates where blood flows from one chamber of the heart to the other. Most common valvular disease that we see in the elderly is, is the aortic stenosis. 
so meaning 80% of people in their 80s have some level of aortic stenosis where you have thickening of the heart, the aortic valve, uh, aortic valve leaflets. And that's the, one of the four valves. It's the last valve through which the left ventricle pumps blood out of the heart into your body. And when you have aortic stenosis, people actually can have what's called, a, 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 the, the mnemonic is SAD, syncope angina dyspnea, where they can actually pass out because intermittently they don't have enough blood flow to their brain and they pass out. They can have chest pain because they're not getting enough blood flow to their coronary arteries because the valve is so tight. Or they can have heart failure, and that, that's actually the most alarming sign of patients that have severe aortic stenosis and they have progression uh, and they need to be uh, they need to have the valve uh, replaced. Uh, so, so moving one step further, you know, traditionally the valve replacement, the aortic valve used to be what's called SAVAR, which is the standard aortic valve sure. replacement where they do the, the sternotomy, take out the old valve and put a new valve. Now the new technology, and we've, we've been doing this, uh, uh, I started the program in 2016 at Glendale Adventist, the, SAVAR, the TAVAR program where we actually go through the groin and then we put a new valve inside the old valve, and that's actually mounted on a, on a stent. Uh, and, and all the, of this, that's laparoscopic? That's, uh, that's percutaneous, where we go from the groin. Yeah. So the procedure takes about 30 to 45 minutes. The patient is uh, awake within an hour, and then uh, they're in the telemetry uh, uh, you know, bed, and then they go home the next morning. So I just did one this morning on a, on a, 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 a patient uh, who uh, was turned down for uh, traditional uh, surgery, the valve replacement, and she was having severe shortness of breath, just even a couple of steps walking. Uh, and uh, so this morning we went in and we actually replaced her valve and the procedure took about 40 minutes. She's awake now, sitting up in her bed, and then uh, uh, we'll be walking soon and then she'll be going home tomorrow morning. So this, br this brings a new, sort of a new chance on life to a lot of patients that uh, traditionally uh, either were not candidates to surgery or they just didn't want to go through with the open heart surgery to have the valve replaced. And most people don't want to have the open heart surgery just because it's such an intense experience. Well, it's an intense experience. Uh, uh, the recovery is long, but also uh, you, you actually have, they have to have their heart arrested and uh, as they, they open their aorta, they have to slice out their aortic valve and put a new valve. This is basically going through the groin and we're mounting a new valve inside the old one it's almost like getting a stent in your heart arteries, and this is a, getting a stent inside your aortic valve, and then you have a new valve uh, basically mounted inside the old one. More Dr. Ballion when we come back. Don't go away. Adventist Health Glendale is nationally ranked for patient care. They get five stars from CMS and an A rating from the Leaprop Group and they are ranked one of the best hospitals in California by U.S. News and World Report. The conversation today is all about you and your heart. Do you have your heartbeat on? Joining us from Adventist Health Glendale is one of my favorites, Dr. Harry Ballion. Uh, doctor, during the break, you were sharing with me two new heart procedures. Can you share with us what they are? Yes, so in addition to the TAVAR, which is a trans-aortic valve replacement, we can actually repair the existing valves, uh, such as the mitral valve, which separates the left upper chamber and left lower chamber of the heart. In time, the valve actually can get leaky, which, and then this is called mitral regurgitation. Uh, and we can actually go through the groin and puncture from the right side of the heart to the left and go down and put, put a clip, which is like a staple, to bring the two leaflets of the mitral valve together so they can actually close more properly. So traditionally, this would have had to be with open heart surgery. Now we can actually go through a percutaneous procedure, put a clip, uh, and then the patient is awake within an hour and they go home the next morning and they actually feel a lot better almost immediately because their leaky valve goes from severe to mild or n none. Um, so that's one major uh, uh, you know, valve procedure that we're doing at Glendale Adventist. Um, and the other one you said is something cool called the Watchman? Watchman, yes. So this is actually a, a very uh, interesting procedure where, uh, so atrial fibrillation, irregular heart rhythm, where you have an irregularity of the, of the uh, asynchronous and irregular beats of the heart that propagates clot formation in the left upper chamber of the heart. And traditionally, the left atrial appendage, which is like a little pouch that basically collects these little debris and the clots, and then patients can send it to their brain, uh, which necessitates them to be on blood thinners. Uh, and as we know, blood thinners, whether it's Coumadin or some of the newer blood thinners as, as, a, as an Eliquis, Xeralto, uh, uh, they actually can cause um, bleeding. And some people that have history of GI bleeding, 
they have fall risk, they are basically, uh, this is prohibitive for them to be on blood thinners. Uh, however, if they don't take blood thinners, they have a high chance of having stroke. Sure. If they take blood thinners, they're going to bleed. So the Watchman procedure is a percutaneous procedure where we go from the groin and then go from the, the, to the right upper chamber, puncture across to the left upper chamber, and put, the, put a little cork. It's like a, putting a cork on the wine bottle, putting a, putting a plug that, that seals off the left atrial appendage and essentially takes the burden away of patients having to be on blood thinners. Uh, within 30 days, they come off of blood thinners. They only have to be on baby aspirin, and that's actually a, a big lifesaver in somebody who who, who bleeds. Uh, I had a patient who has uh, bladder CA and bladder cancer, and he he was having profuse hematuria. His hemoglobin was down in six, and then he has atrial fibrillation, and he had had a history of a stroke. So I I did the Watchman device on him, and he came off of the blood thinners. Uh, safely, and he's been on a baby aspirin, and he's done. He's done great, and his hemoglobin is stabilized. So this is a procedure that takes about 30 to 40, 40 minutes, and patients can go home the same day or the or the following morning, and uh, and basically they do great. So. But how exciting, because it also changes the trajectory of someone's future. Absolutely. So so we we it's <coughs> safe. Uh, we take him off of blood thinners, and then also the burden of them having a stroke is is gone because now this. The, the area where clots accumulate has been sealed off. And then, so that's essentially what, what happens with the Watchman procedure. Um, somebody smokes. They are refusing to quit. What do you say to them, doctor? You know, tobacco is a big, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a very serious problem. And especially in our community here, uh, we have a lot of smokers. And tobacco literally accelerates your risk of heart attacks, peripheral vascular disease. And uh, you know, you we I, I lecture my patients, and I'm 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 mad at them when they when they don't quit. They come to the office after their, their heart attack, and they have their cigarettes in their pocket. It's almost like somebody walking into the police station with a gun in their pocket. It it it's really bad news. Um, and uh, and somebody says, uh, doctor, I don't really smoke. I say, what does that mean? Uh, well, I smoke here and there. I said, it's it's like asking somebody, are you pregnant? And they say, I'm a little bit pregnant. It doesn't work like that. You either smoke or don't smoke. It's and true. Yeah. So so essentially, uh, tobacco cessation is is very very important, especially in people that have that are diabetic uh, patients that have high cholesterol. It's almost like the the trip three headed monster. If you're smoking and you have the three major uh, uh, problems such as diabetes, hypertension, <coughs> high cholesterol. Tobacco is just going to add, uh, it's like pouring gasoline, pouring uh, matches on the, on the gasoline, it's going to erupt. So it's only a matter of time where you're going to end up in the cath lab, you're going to end up with a big uh, um, vascular catastrophe. Two packs of cigarettes a day for 20 years, and I have uh, it. was 17 years. That you I stopped. haven't had a cigarette in 17 years. Thank, thank um, you for doing that. Well, no, here's what I say about that. I would get up and have a choice, make a choice to get a cigarette. I now wake up and choose not to have a cigarette. That's it. It's, it's, it's all a choice. In, it's all in your mind. I it's, mean, my dad would say, "Why would you make something so small be so big?" Exactly. Uh, how do we keep our heart healthy? Before we run out of time, um, share with us Ad, how to have a healthy heart lifestyle. So it, it, again, it's a choice. You know, you basically uh, have to make sure you eliminate the junk food. You eliminate the processed food. And you have three good meals a day, and and don't eat late at night. Uh, and a lot of people have this bad habit of snacking. You make sure three to four hours before bedtime you're not eating, and that actually accelerates your metabolism. And and a lot of the late snacks are what goes directly uh, and you know in your adipose cells. So, but but also additionally, you know, uh, making sure you cut out the soft drinks. You know, you cut out some of, a lot of the junk food as I mentioned. Uh, eat three meals a day and, and try to minimize or do away with the snacking. If you're doing a snack, that should be a fruit like an apple, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, exercise is very important. Three to five days a week at least. You, know, you should do 20 to 30 minutes of uh, uh, combined cardiovascular exercise and uh, isometric where you're doing weights. Uh, so, so again, all of those should go hand in hand. You, you, it's a choice. You can choose to sleep. Uh, uh, sleep in or get up, set your alarm clock, and get yourself to the gym. So, and that, that's what I do. I set my alarm at 4:45 and get up and go go to my gym uh, and Equinox and then do my workout. So, and that's why you look like this, and no, this is why you no. can save lives you, and share with us how to keep our heartbeat on. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, here's the truth: 
It's your heart. February is Heart Awareness Month. So what are you going to say to your family, your friends, your loved ones? How are you going to invite them to keep your heart beating? Because uh, without your heart, there's not much you can do. So also for you that smoke, here's one thing I want to say to you. Two packs a day for over 20 years, I made a choice. Bottom line, you smoke, you can possibly die. Every this is just another minute of you taking away your life. Stay here for yourself. Be here with family and friends. And if you or someone you love is struggling with it, reach out to me. Let me, let me walk this with you. It's the best gift I gave myself and it's the best gift I've given my family and friends. Remember, the most important conversation you are going to have is about you and your health. So let's talk about it. Thank you for joining us. Get your heartbeat on. We'll see you next time. Thanks.